Uh, dear friends and comrades uh, gathered in Budapest, first my apologies for not being able to be with you today. Uh, the reason for this is very simple. Uh, I have been asked to wait uh, to be on standby in case I have to go to Caracas at very short notice to interview uh, President Nicolas uh, Maduro. As you all know, the situation in Venezuela is very tense and serious with the United States sanctions and with threats of uh, military intervention, etc., etc. So forgive me, I was really looking forward to being in Budapest, uh, one of the few cities uh, major cities or capitals I have never ever visited uh, and I hope to come some other time. Uh, it's the 100th anniversary uh, uh, of a big event, an event which was a failure, which was your revolution. The Hungarian revolution that took place on the 21st of March 1919, almost exactly a hundred years ago this week. So what was this event and can we learn anything from it? Well, if one studies it closely, what emerges is a Communist Party in Hungary composed of incredibly courageous workers and intellectuals, but very weak in the countryside, decided after the successes of the Russian Revolution to launch an uprising in Budapest. They couldn't do this on their own, as you know better than me, but they decided to merge with the Social Democrats, who were very half-hearted about bringing about any serious fundamental change. And the situation was fluid. The war had ended, the Entente powers, the victorious Entente powers, were trying to crush any revolutionary upsurges uh, in other parts of Europe. And the uh, Romanian army, with a complement of Czech and Polish soldiers, was sent in to Budapest to crush your revolution. Many of them deserted. We should never forget that. A lot of Romanian soldiers refused to fight. A lot of Czech soldiers deserted. But despite this, the Entente powers were successful in crushing uh, an experiment which lasted, if my memory is uh, correct from the books, 133 days. Lenin was extremely angry and self-critical that the Hungarian Revolution had been left to defeat. And later, in later years, he wrote briefly about why they hadn't been able to send the Red Army in and on reflection if they had the Hungarian Revolution could have been saved. Who knows? These are interesting uh, counterfactuals, but one thing is clear. Had Hungary become a socialist workers' republic for even a few years, it could have changed the situation in neighboring countries, especially uh, uh, affected the German Revolution, uh, which also went down to defeat, thus completely isolating the Bolsheviks. Should they have merged with the Social Democrats? Lenin's criticism was that the Communists should have remained an independent party and formed an alliance with the Social Democrats rather than merging with them. Because the merger in which the Social Democrats were dominant was bound to uh, adversely impact on the spread of the revolution. We will never know. The revolution was defeated. To jump from there to 1956 is a big jump, but it's a jump we must make because after the Second World War and the collaboration of the Hungarian regime and the Hothiites with the Third Reich, 
the sending off of large numbers of Hungarian Jews to the camps at the last minute, in, as late as 1944, uh, led ultimately to a Soviet occupation in a communist government whose popular support was great, greater, much, much greater in the late 40s than it was in the 50s. And the imposition of a Stalinist style regime in Hungary, as we know in the case of other Eastern European countries, was a huge mistake and an error. And it was this that led in 1956 to the Hungarian uprising in which Hothiites from the right undoubtedly participated, but the workers of Budapest in particular, intellectuals, communist dissidents, famous philosophers, also participated. And who knows what would have happened had Soviet tanks not entered uh, Budapest and crushed that uprising. That happened very soon after Khrushchev had denounced Stalin and the terrors of Stalinism inside the Soviet Union. And it was felt by the Soviet ambassador that unless things were brought under control, Eastern Europe could be lost. And the Soviet ambassador was Yuri Andropov, later a member of the Soviet Politburo and the man largely responsible for bringing Mikhail Gorbachev into power and appointing him first secretary of the Soviet Union. So contradictions everywhere. Now that uprising did lead to a relaxation. There's no doubt about that. I mean, we were all very critical of it, uh, even as young people. And later, we used to talk a, a lot with Nicholas Krashaw and other new left uh, comrades from Budapest, who explained that despite the crushing of the uprising, the very fact that it had taken place had led to reforms. And that Hungary, in some ways, in the late 50s, especially the uh, early 60s, uh, was one of the more liberal countries in terms of expression of opinions, etc. You will know that uh, better than me. So the whole history of Hungarian uh, socialism, Hungarian communism has been caught up in the, with, by the, in the conflict of the great powers, the First World War and then the Second World War and what followed these uh, uh, wars. And that is how it always is uh, in Europe and has been for a, for a long time. It is worth recalling though that one of those in Hungary who supported the 56 uprising was the great Hungarian philosopher Georgi Lukács, uh, who had a huge impact on the world uh, via his intellect and his writings. And he had to seek refuge in the Yugoslav embassy in 56. Uh, his life was spared, though Imre Noj, the communist prime minister, dissident communist prime minister of the uprising, was of course uh, arrested, given a sort of lynch mob trial and executed. Uh, a fatal error, a fatal error committed by the Soviet Union, which they didn't repeat in Prague in 1968, almost uh, 12 years uh, later, when none of the dissident communist leaders were actually hanged. They were removed, they were given bad jobs, but none of them were hanged or even imprisoned for very long periods, if at all. So where does that leave us now? This current century, 100 years later, could not be more different. If in the first half of the 20th century there was hope that something new would happen, that a new world order would be created with all its problems, with all its mistakes, and that some things couldn't be reversed, and one has to say how wrong we were, those of us on the new left, those in more orthodox uh, uh, political uh, organizations, because with the 90s, everything was reversed. The attacks on um, state ownership, the privatizations that took place, the creation of an ideological atmosphere which implied that any state intervention to help the poor was a throwback to the worst days of, uh, of Stalin and Stalinism. Uh, this did catch on. 
it caught on and it <coughs> worked like that for a long time. And since the 90s, there has been, if you like, as far as the left is concerned, a huge vacuum. Big, big vacuum in politics where the center parties became dominant, their ideology became dominant. This pattern broke down in 2008 after the huge Wall Street crash, which suddenly made people sit up. And those who had thought that everything would carry on as normal, that there would be um, you know, money for everyone, anyone could become a millionaire, this whole thing that was put around, suddenly revealed the stark, dark face of financial capitalism with figures emerging rapidly afterwards, showing the incredible inequalities of wealth with 1% of the population controlling a large bulk of the world's wealth, with global millionaires and billionaires running everything, the symbiosis between politicians and finance capital in every single country. This then <coughs> led to a process of rethinking. It is, if you th we think back on it, quite astonishing and revealing the arrogance of the rulers that they never realized they should make some changes. After all, capitalism had adjusted to the Russian Revolution uh, in the early years of the 20th century by pushing social democracy forward as a democratic alternative permitting social democracy to push through many reforms to say there were other ways of working. This time they didn't feel any need to do that in 2008. They didn't feel challenged. There were no big political parties challenging them. The giant communist parties of Europe, the Italian communist party, the French communist party uh, had collapsed. Nothing had really taken their place. And so in this vacuum stepped in all the monsters from the past, people who we, would, we thought had been defeated forever, the people who had collaborated with the Third Reich, people who were openly declared themselves, people who openly declared themselves as fascists, especially in parts of uh, uh, the eastern uh, part of the continent, the Ukraine is what I was uh, referring to. And in your own country you saw a rise of uh, nationalism, right-wing nation nationalism, and then we saw a wave of uh, semi-insurrections, political insurrections, which brought newer parties and newer groups to power, um, or edging towards power. Uh, we saw changes taking place uh, in South America, and at the same time we saw the United States determined to prevent any big shift in the Arab world by directly intervening and smashing the you know, most progressive country on the social level, Iraq, into pieces. And Syria too has been destroyed. And in Eastern Europe, the situation, which you know better than me, is dire. It is worth just remarking that the recent upsurge in Hungary of young people and old people against what you call the slave laws has had very little impact on forcing some intervention by the European Union to stop these laws who clash with workers' rights as interpreted in many, many uh, uh, laws of the uh, European Union. And it's worth noticing that the European Union intervenes very harshly as they did in the case of Greece where government is elected with promises to move to the left, uh, to challenge the privatizations, to stop the privatizations. That government is crushed, its party divided, its leader defeated, and then recast as a person from the new, what I have called the extreme center. That is how they treat Greece. In the case of Hungary, where the exploitation proposed by these new laws of the working class will be the worst in Europe, nothing happens. Nothing happens. The movement I know has um, receded and come to an end, which is a pity. I hope it rises again, because we see a contrast 
in France, where the Yellow Vest challenged Macron's neoliberalism and have carried on, you know, for nearly 12, 13 weeks now, uh, protesting every weekend. The news is coming that this weekend's marches all over France will be the largest because of the brutality, the vicious brutality deployed by Macron's police force against the demonstrators. Uh, Photographs today show how one woman had her hand amputated by uh, the, the, the French police. So Europe is in trouble and it is not necessarily the case that only the right or the far right should take advantage of this, which is why the movements that have arisen in Hungary, the victory of Jeremy Corbyn in the Labour Party, in uh, Britain, uh, a victory which would not have taken place had we not had a full-blown political insurrection by young people who wanted change, who joined the Labour Party in their hundreds and thousands and voted Corbyn in as uh, uh, leader. <clears throat> France, anything could happen in France. In Italy, the Centre Party has been wiped out and we have a coalition of the Estrella, the five stars who stand for God knows what, and Salvini, an extremely clever and capable far-right politician. So the Europe that was supposed to come into being uh, is dead, really. And even now in Germany, new political formations are arising and developing. And in this case, I think what we need is a Europe from below. It would be a huge tragedy if the official Europe collapsed, which it could do over the next four to five years. One shouldn't exclude this. And therefore, links between movements, between trade unions, between progressive political parties, between individuals, intellectuals, on a European scale, and indeed, if possible, where possible on a world scale, becomes more necessary uh, than before. And I, I am sure that many of these issues will be discussed by you in uh, greater uh, detail. My, I wish you the best of luck for this conference.